Welcome to LTM. I am Andrew Plummer, and today I want to ask the question, what can we learn about writing from Legends in Lattes? Let's begin. Ah, Legends in Lattes by Travis Baldry. It's a low-stakes, cozy fantasy novel that's gained quite a lot of popularity here on BookTube. And when I found it at Costco, I decided, okay, well, I'll pick it up. Let's see what everyone's talking about. I'll admit, not really my cup of tea, but I do think there's actually quite a lot we can learn here. Before I go any further, though, I do want to tell you this video will most likely contain spoilers. Like all good writing critiques, I'm going to start with a summary. So we have Viv, who is an orc warrior who's decided she is tired of adventuring and wants to settle down. She wants to build a coffee shop in a town that has never heard of coffee. And to do it, she has a bag of money and riches and a magical trinket. She enlists the help of Calamity, or Cal, who is a hob carpenter. He helps her turn a livery into a coffee shop. After it's done, she puts out a help wanted sign and Tandry comes into the picture. Tandry is a succubus. Now, she doesn't do the normal succubus things, but she does act as the guide for Viv in this small, cozy little town. There's also a little bit of a mob boss in this town who wants to extort money from Viv for protection. We also are eventually introduced to a ratkin called Thimble, who will become the cook at this cafe. Her cafe is a wild success. And this success leads her to worry a little bit about the Madrigal, this mob boss figure. She eventually buckles and calls her old adventuring companions for help. They show up a little bewildered that Viv can't deal with this situation on her own, and then leave after offering a small smidgen of guidance. The Madrigal and Viv work out a deal. Instead of money, they're gonna use cinnamon rolls. During the course of this conversation, it does become clear, though, that Viv still has a problem. Her ex-adventuring partner is on the hunt for this magical trinket that has given Viv all this success. Viv tries to confront this head-on by having magical wards placed on this trinket so that she will know if anything happens, and eventually something does. The old adventuring partner shows up trying to take it. She scares him off, and then steps need to be taken. Tandry moves in, and they sleep every night together in the same bed undressed, but in purely platonic ways. This is when the real romance, if you can call it that, of Tandry and Viv begins. They go on a couple of dates and have a couple of conversations where we learn a little bit more about Tandry and how she used to go to this magical school nearby until racism became a problem. All this culminates in the climax of the novel when... One night, while Tandry and Viv are sleeping in their beds, the ex-adventurer comes to claim the trinket yet again. This time, he sets the cafe on fire. Not just any fire, magical fire. Viv saves Tandry and this magical cat that has become their pet, I guess, from this blaze and loses the trinket to the ex-adventurer. All of this culminates in the disillusionment of Viv. With the cafe burned down and her magical trinket gone, she's not sure that she can have the success that she had the first time. Tandry convinces Viv to rebuild. The found family of this small town shows up and everyone puts in their share, including the mob boss, who no longer is the mob boss, but now an investor in this cafe. As the cafe starts to see success again, Viv decides that she's going to share the wealth with her found family and makes them all equal partners in this business. After the conversation where she tells her found family this, she holds Tandry back, and for the first time, they kiss. At the end of the book, we also get a section where the mob boss has tracked down the arsonist as he returns to the scene of the crime, and the magical cat that has become the pet of Viv and Tandry jumps on him though it's unclear whether he lives or not. It's not a super in-depth summary, but it does give you enough to understand what this novel is trying to do. So, what's next on our writing critique adventure? Well, I will tell you right now. We're going to look at what did it do right? You know, I'm going to I'm going to be honest. I actually really like the idea for this novel. The ex-adventurer who wants to settle down, I think is fertile ground for the fantasy genre as a whole. Uh, we get a lot of epic fantasies where 
things are happening, but what about afterward? What about the characters when they decide this isn't for them anymore? And so I, I actually thought this idea was really cool. I, I really wanted to, to see this done as best as it could be. I also think that Travis Baldry did a fairly good job in the fire scene, the climax of this novel. And so I just, you know, I think that that's more of what we should have seen throughout. I also think the world's kind of cool with the mixing up of like succubus and ratkin and all these other magical creatures that exist in fantasy into like one cohesive story. It's, it's intriguing and interesting. I also can see how this appeals to readers of the cozy coffee shop genre. It hits all the marks from my understanding and because of the fantasy elements in the fantastic world, it seems to have everything it needs to. On from what works to what doesn't. I'm going to be honest, I think there's a lot to be improved here. I am not going to cover it all in this video, but I am going to try and hit the big three that I think really need work. I'm just going to say it, Viv doesn't work. Uh, time and time again, we're told that Viv is this warrior who has all this inner strength, and yet constantly throughout the book, we see that she is timid or incapable of solving her own problems. Uh, more than once, we get her saying, I didn't think of that. And for something that is your retirement plan, basically, to have thought so little about the intricacies of it is quite honestly telling that she didn't really think of this as a plan. It, it makes me wonder, why didn't she just go to the gnomish city that she found coffee in and just take her wealth there and just enjoy the rest of her days drinking coffee without having to try and sell it. Like what makes her want to sell it? What made her not capable of thinking this plan through? The character just doesn't match what we see. She's timid, she's, you know, shy. And quite honestly, if somebody's charging into battle and fighting monsters, I, I expect them to have a little bit of an ego. I expect them to have self-confidence that they can do it. And she just doesn't, it, it, it's, it's a problem. And, you know, in, in our stories, as we write our own characters and we read this, you know, things that we're writing, we want to be honest with ourselves and say, does this character work? Yes, we might have an emotional attachment to the character, right? I, I'm sure Travis Baldry loves Viv, but we need to make sure that that character comes across, that, that whatever makes that psyche of that character work it needs to be in the novel, and it's not here. And and I encourage you to go read it so that you can see what it's like when a character doesn't match their description, because this is an example of that. This is a problem. And for our writing, we want to make sure that our characters come through crystal clear. So make sure that everything your character does makes sense. Everything is true to who they are, and it really is your character thinking and saying things. I mean, yeah, obviously you're writing it, but that character needs to come through. And if there's dissonance or discontinuity between how they're described and what they do, that's a source of internal conflict that we can explore. And it's not explored here. And that's why it, it doesn't work for me. The second really big problem here is we don't have a lot of conflict. Uh, we have a lot of obstacles, but we don't have a lot of conflict. And let me explain what the difference is. An obstacle is something your character has to do. They're willing to do it, they can do it, and they just need to do it to further the plot along or solve a problem. A conflict is an obstacle that the character either doesn't want to do or can't do or has to learn something to do. There's, there's some reason why they just cannot overcome that obstacle at this time. This book really only has two conflicts. We have the conflict of the madrigal and we have the conflict of the fire. So that's why I think the fire scene works pretty well. It's one of the real examples of conflict we have in this book. Viv's and Tandri's lives are at stake here. This fire really is going to burn this cafe to the ground. And if they're inside, they will die. We have real stakes. We have a real conflict. We have a real problem. It's the same with the Madrigal, up until the solution, at least. The Madrigal is this mob figure who's trying to extort money from Viv, and Viv doesn't want to pay. She's unwilling to 
hurdle, this obstacle. And so that's a conflict. How is this going to resolve? The rest of the things in this are just obstacles, to be honest. Uh, I don't have a, an assistant. Oh, I'll put a help wanted sign out. Oh, that got solved. I now have an assistant. Oh, it's fulfilling this romantic interest that I have. Oh, you know, I have a character in my cafe or a character. I have a patron of my cafe who doesn't want to drink coffee. Oh, well, you know, I have to serve him pastries. Oh, that ratkin over there who comes in all the time for the coffee. He's a baker and he's a magnificent baker. So, you know, like everything is just an obstacle that gets solved and it's not really Viv who's solving it. And this is a key thing we need to remember for our own writing. Our protagonist has to be the agent. They have have to be the one solving their own problems. If somebody else is solving the problems, why are we not getting them? Why are we reading about the protagonist and not this other character who's solving the problems? And so Viv needs to solve more of the problems that she has. And the solution doesn't need to be, oh, I just go give money to this somebody else. That's not interesting. There's nothing, you know, fantastical about just paying somebody to do something. There needs to be stakes. There needs to be a reason that it can't be done. Otherwise, your conflicts are just obstacles. And the third issue I want to touch on is not the romance or lack thereof in this novel, but character consolidation. The general advice is don't have more characters than you need. If your character is there, they need to do something that the other characters can't. And this is where I have a problem. We have Lainey, who is this old woman who's across the street, kind of a grandmotherly figure to Tandri and Viv. And then we have the Madrigal, who is this old lady who is a mob boss. Now, I know that those serve two different roles in the sense of one's caring, one's kind of the conflict, but do they need to be different people? I mean, if they do need to be different people, that's fine, but then I need more from Lainey to make her somehow distinct. Otherwise, I'd have just two old biddies who live in this town. One of them's a mob boss and one of them's this nice grandmother. Wouldn't it be more interesting? Or, I mean, in, in my view, again, like, obviously, the Travis has to make whatever decisions he wants, but I would have expected a more interesting solution to the conflict of the Madrigal if Lainey was the Madrigal, if Lainey was the mob boss. You have only one old lady instead of two, the old lady who's grandmotherly. Now we have a conflict where, wait a minute, she's extorting money from Viv, and then that's a whole different realm. Like, I don't know if we need Lainey, to be honest. I think this could all just be solved with the Madrigal by making Lainey and the Madrigal the same person. And you see this all the time, actually, in books when they're adapted to movies and television. If a plot line isn't interesting enough to make it into the movie or the TV show, they'll cut the plot line. But if you cut the plot line, you're going to have to maybe cut some characters too. And so we'll get characters who completely disappear. I mean, like Lord of the Rings, Tom Bombadil is gone. But do we need Tom Bombadil? Probably not. I mean, just if you cut the fact that they never go there, then you don't really need the character. And, you know, and so like there's... Character consolidation is important, and we want to make sure that we don't have too many characters. The characters that we do have in our novels, they need to be distinct, they need to stand out, and they need to serve a role that no other character can fill. Otherwise, why wouldn't that other character just fill that role? I want to thank you very much. I know that uh, there's a lot here. And in fact, if you want to read my full critique, go to learningtomaster.com. I have a much more extensive and in-depth review of Legends and Lattes. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. And I will see you next time right here on Learning to Master. What is this book about? Well, we have Liv. Liv? No, not Liv. We don't have Liv Taylor. That'd be crazy.